Housing and Urban Development. I work in the Office of Field Policy and Management. I am going to be your moderator today for the HUD plenary session. Um, we are um, fortunate to have uh, Ms. Brett uh, Esders from our, the SNAPS office as she's a senior program specialist in the Office of Special Needs and Assistance Programs, as well as Mr. Mark Sorbo from the uh, Detroit Field Office of HUD and in from the Community Planning and Development Programs. Um, they're gonna do a presentation today um, on different uh, on the items in the agenda. Uh, this session is being recorded. Um, there will be followed by a question and answer session. So um, please you know, make note of any questions you have as we're going through and hold them for uh, the next session, which will be in Teams. Uh, so we'll, be, we'll leave this session and move over to the Teams platform to, to do the question and answer period. Um, with all that being said, I'm gonna turn it over now to um, Mark's, Mr. Mark Sorbo uh, to do the presentation. Thanks, Dan. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Happy to be here. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Brett and I, we're going to just walk through some of the kind of HUD update type of stuff. Um, and uh, I was going to cover more of the local impact items. Uh, so things like um, uh, that are relevant to our, our work in the state within the state of Michigan uh, and some of the roles that our office, uh, our field office in Detroit uh, Bills in terms of assisting you in doing your work. Uh, so, uh, and I think as Dan had mentioned, if you have questions, um, Brett and I will be uh, available after this session is done. This is gonna be mostly just a presentation type of session. And then after this is done, we can, we're gonna have a Q and A. Um, so if you have questions, if you can just maybe jot them down or you can also enter them if you want into the chat and then we can revisit those in, in the question and answer uh, section, which is gonna be directly after this one. So um, let me see if, uh, Dan, are you gonna move the slides forward or do you want me to do it? Okay, perfect. So uh, yep, again, I'm Mark Sorbo. I am a program manager at the, uh, the HUD Detroit field office um, in the Office of Community Planning and Development. And the HUD Detroit field office covers the HUD grants, um, the homeless assistance grants, the continuum of care grants for throughout the state of Michigan. Uh, so. This is really just an overview slide of the things that Brett and I are gonna to talk to you about. As I kind of mentioned, uh, I'll do some of the local stuff. Brett's gonna do some of the national stuff. Uh, and then we have a, a series of additional kind of resources and things like that. Those are mostly just links. Um, I understand the presentation will be provided uh, to everybody. So, um, you know, we probably won't spend a lot of time going over the links, but they're there in case people wanna use them. So, um, so getting into the local HUD updates, what I thought would be useful is, uh, I still feel a, a, a series of questions pretty regularly on that deal with some of the kind of basic organizational structure or bureaucratic structure that uh, of HUD in the field. So I just wanted to go over briefly kind of how HUD is structured and, and organized and, and how uh, both Brett and I kind of fit within that structure and, and how the Continuum Care Grant Program and the ESG Grant Program uh, fit as well. So uh, this is an overall uh, agency map for HUD. As you can see, everything kind of filters up to the Secretary of HUD. The one that's highlighted in yellow is uh, the office called the Office of Community Planning and Development. And that's the office that Brett and I work out of. And that's the office that provides uh, the majority of homeless assistance funds uh, through HUD. Um, and then this is within the Office of Community Planning and Development. There is a number of sub offices. Uh, each one has their own assigned grant programs and, and functions. Uh, so those little boxes within there just list the different funds. So Community Development Block Grant, CDBG, um, the Emergency Solutions Grants uh, and the Continuum of Care Grants are funded through the Office of Special Needs Assistance Programs. That's where Brett's out of. Um, and if you go to the next slide, then it'll kind of, we'll get into some of the local. So locally, how, how HUD is organized is uh, we have field office presence on various offices across, around the country. And that provides uh, local technical assistance uh, and management of the grants to uh, the various grant recipients throughout the country. Um, and we have, uh, you can see there, there's 43 different field offices uh, that HUD Community Planning and Development works out of, and we have over 400 employees. Um, these are going to be the the day-to-day -day people that that you will, that y'all will tend to interact with uh, related to your to your HUD grants. So within the Detroit field office, and again, the Detroit field office, uh, we oversee all the 
ESG and COC grants uh, throughout the state of Michigan. So um, our office reports up through a, a CPD director um, and we have a couple different type of employee classifications. We have financial analysts uh, who handle the, the fiscal management. Uh, we have a new CARES Act representative who is overseeing everything related to CARES Act, which if you don't know what that is, I'll get into the CARES Act stuff uh, a little later. But we also have a program uh, administrative assistant. And then we have two program managers who each oversee a team of uh, CPD representatives who are sort of the day-to-day -day liaisons between HUD and and, and your organizations if you're providing uh, homeless services through the ESG or COC programs. Uh, so this slide is that same uh, structure, but with the actual people's names that fill those roles. So our, our CPD director out of our Detroit office is Keith Hernandez. Uh, and then our fiscal analysts are Cindy Vales. Cynthia or Cindy Vales handles the formula grant side. Margaret Moman handles the continuum of care grants. Uh, Carlos Bradley is our newest employee who is uh, focused on CARES Act uh, grant assistance, and she oversees grants across a number of different field offices. Martha Stallworth is our administrative assistant. Uh, Ellen Chung and myself are program managers who oversee the respective teams of CPD representatives. Um, and so that's just our sort of organizational structure there. Um, I put this one in there because uh, I still, as I mentioned, I get a lot of emails about structured things. And I also get a lot of emails that people are indicating they're not sure who their assigned CPD representative is or CPD point of contact. Uh, so this one list, I know it's kind of small and hopefully when the slides come out, if you need to, you can kind of blow it up, print it out as necessary. But uh, this is our, our office assignment uh, portfolio. So each rep and each one of those people listed there is a CPD representative. And underneath it, you'll see they're assigned communities and then they're assigned continuums. Uh, so each continuum is assigned to one rep with the exception of the Detroit, the 501 uh, city of Detroit continuum. That one is split between two of our reps uh, because it's, it's, it has so many members. Um, so this is really just a, yeah, an overview of those. Uh, and then the next one will detail, the next slide after this one details our financial analyst. So again, a lot of you may interact with Margaret Moman um, for things like grant amendments on the continuum of care grants, um, grant processing, budget amendments, ELOCs access, things like that. Or if you are uh, if you work on the homeless shelter side with uh, ESG funding uh, directly for a city or community, you may interact with Cindy uh, as it pertains to uh, things like IDIS um, or, or um, financial matters on those grants. And again, our new staff member is Carla. Uh, she oversees CARES Act grants, uh, which we'll get into what those are um, across two different HUD regions. So she has these um, 10 different offices. So, so she has a very, very wide scope but, um, of assistance that she provides to, uh, but it's only specific to the CARES Act. So there's uh, some breakdown, as we've kind of mentioned, between uh, what the work that's done by HUD in headquarters uh, where Brett is works out of and in the field uh, where I work out of. Uh, so just to, this is just a brief sort of selection of activities is not a comprehensive in nature, but just want to cover a couple of things. So uh, on the on the headquarters side, uh, they sort of calculate the formula award amounts uh, for the formula grants. That's the community development block grants, the ESG grants, things like that. They also publish and review competitive NOFAs. So things for the continuum of care grant program. Uh, the, the the publication the drafting publication and review of those of the NOFA is all done by headquarters staff. Um, they also determine the annual monitoring goals. Um, they publish monitoring documents. Uh, they provide high level policy and technical assistance to CPD staff and sometimes directly to grantees as well. Um, and they then they provide overall management of the HUD programs and the field staff. Uh, so in the field, what we do is is more of the, the hands on work with the grant recipients. Uh, so we complete an annual risk analysis of all grant recipients. We schedule and complete on-site and remote monitoring visits. Um, and then as a result of those visits, we prepare and issue reports. Um, we review and approve the various plans and, and reports that are submitted by our grant recipients, um, as well as annual audits. Uh, we provide on-site and remote technical assistance to the grant recipients. Uh, and we provide uh, responses to citizen requests, grant or grantee requests and complaints. Um, sometimes they are walk-in requests, things like that. Sometimes they're called or emailed uh, and we sort of coordinate the response on those as well. 
Uh, so just a, a couple of policy updates regarding our office uh, since the, um, the start of the pandemic here. Uh, we are working almost entirely remotely as, as an office. So um, we are still functional. We're working every day, but we're doing it mostly uh, from our home or, or offsite uh, environments. So we do have restrictions on in-person events and activities. I know there's not a ton of them going on nowadays, uh, but if, if you were to invite us out for some kind of an event or something, um, you were still not really permitted to go to, to much uh, on-site um, activities and, and things like that right now. Uh, that would include things like technical assistance and monitoring. Um, so we still can provide all these uh, activities, uh, technical assistance, we're still gonna do monitoring, but we're gonna do it in a more virtual or remote setting, uh, much like this meeting today. Um, and our meetings and conferences and things like that we've been doing are all remote and digital as well. Uh, so uh, just as sort of reminders for when you're interfacing with our office, uh, I always kind of stress to focus on email communication if at all possible. Um, we have our, to, at, our, um, at our availability, the use of video conferencing materials. We can do screen sharing, presentations, um, conference calls, stuff like that. Uh, we do have limited access to physical mail because we're not in the office every day. Um, so that's why I say to focus on sort of email communication, if that's at all possible within your organization. Uh, we do also have access to, to phones and voicemails, but email is sort of still the best way um, to then we can you know, make sure we get a response documented and all that. Uh, and then use of digital signatures, if at all possible, things like grant agreements, stuff like that. Um, so I mentioned before the CARES Act, and for people that aren't familiar, uh, Congress passed the CARES Act, I believe it was back in April, uh, and the CARES Act was sort of a, a very large uh, assistance, response, prevention um, source of funds to enact as related to COVID-19 um, and the effects in the United States. Uh, so it was very large in, in sort of with scope, but a section of that, about $9 billion total, was allocated to HUD that was that to be used on um, what, are, what we call our CARES Act grants, which are uh, similar in nature to our uh, Community Development Block Grant, Emergency Solutions Grant, and Housing for People with HIV AIDS grant programs. Um, and these were mostly given to state and local governments. Uh, the exception is that a few uh, grant, a few nonprofits did receive uh, HOPWA grants. Uh, so this is the total amount that was received by HUD. And then the column to the right of that is the amount that was that was um, granted out in Michigan in the relevant programs um, that everything was provided to. Uh, one note there is that. Uh, a lot of this money has now been provided or allocated, and we're in the process still of, of getting the money to a lot of the local recipients. Um, and in terms of how we track the money so far, uh, as of last week, 0.8%, so less than 1% of the funding had actually been expended and reimbursed through our, our tracking systems. So the vast majority of this funding is still out there, either waiting to be spent or even waiting to be allocated. And so how it sort of ties back to how this is relevant to, to, to assisting, um, you know, with ending homelessness and, and addressing the impacts of homelessness in our communities is this money that HUD gave out uh, through this CARES Act and even the annual money that HUD gives out every year for community development block grant, for emergency solutions grants, for HOPOA, all that money has to go through a planning process at the local level. So cities, counties, and states that receive federal funds are required to put together a plan uh, both a consolidated plan that covers a long period of time, usually five years, uh, sort of like a big how a community intends to um, to expend funding within their community, uh, and then an annual action plan, which once the funding is is allocated, um, the communities are are expected to provide a plan for for proposed activities um, based on the resources expected. Um, and the reason I talk about this is because a, a big part of these plans are coordination with local partners, uh, of which continuum of care and homeless service providers are a big component. Uh, so uh, now, especially, maybe perhaps more than ever, with all this CARES Act money out there, um, it's, it's very important to be connected to the planning process at the local level within your community and the state level if, you, um, if you're reporting through a, a balance of state continuum. And 
that will help ensure that that your organization and that your um, your viewpoint is is heard and is considered when the uh, decisions are being made for how to spend these these funding at the local level. Uh, HUD provides the allocations of the awards, and we oversee the uh, execution of the awards and in, in, in the management of how they're spent. But we do not make those local funding decisions. Those are all made uh, through these local planning processes. So, uh, so often we talk to people that are engaged in homeless assistance efforts, and in the, a common thing that we hear is that there there's not enough local funding available for it. And I'm I'm that is always almost always the case. Um, and what I say is that ensure that they're involved in that local planning process. There's no guarantee that that's going to be adequate to assist all the needs in the community, but it will at least make sure that you're communicating with the people that are making those decisions for where the funds are going at the local level. Um, and there was there are a couple changes to the planning process uh, as a result of the CARES Act. Um, most of these changes are related to um, that are specific to the uh, the citizen participation and plan processes related to sort of moving it to a virtual environment so that you don't have to have in person meetings. Uh, there's some shortened windows on the public comment period, and this is all related to uh, expediting getting this CARES Act money out into the communities so that they can use the money where it's necessary to uh, respond to prevent and address the effects of COVID in their communities. Uh, there were a couple of, of things that that were also uh, implemented through the CARES Act uh, policy or statutory issues that make it um, that maybe widen the scope or availability of funding to assist uh, with homelessness. Um, a couple of those are public service caps waivers, which I'll talk about on the next slide, but I just wanted to mention briefly here, um, and uh, some adjustments to how emergency financial assistance is provided using uh, CDBG and CDBG CV money. So the next slide, I'll sort of talk some, I think, about. Um, some of the potential. These are just a, this is a selection of potential uh, homeless assistance activities uh, that could be funded through um, CDBG Community Development Block Grant money, uh, as well as the Community Development Block Grant CARES Act money, which is CDBG CV, uh, as well as emergency solutions grants. Um, so uh, the big thing I mentioned, uh, one of the big things, at least public services. Um, so within the sort of homeless assistance realm, public services would be uh, funding that's for a wide range of various activities and services that are um, useful or irrelevant within the homeless assistance realm. Uh, that could be food banks, soup kitchens, um, the various uh, myriad of, of uh, client uh, case services, case management and services, uh, whether that's child care, health services, substance abuse services, um, housing assistance services, things like that, that are, are done uh, within the, the homeless assistance realm. And so when I mentioned the public service cap, I just wanna kind of talk about that a little bit. Previously, uh, the community development block grant funding that was provided to local uh, communities in the in states had a, what's called a public service cap, which means the entities, the recipients, the local communities, cities, counties, and states could not spend more than 15% of that allocation on so-called public services that we were just discussing. So with the CARES Act, uh, so, so for both the CARES Act assistance, as well as the annual award, CDBG, for 2019 and 2020, uh, that public service cap has been waived. So there isn't a limit on, on how much of these funding can go towards these, these relevant public services. Uh, again, these are all decisions that are made at the local level. So again, we go back to that planning uh, aspect of it, which is why it's important to be involved in that. Uh, another sort of relevant um, homeless assistance activity the grant program would be um, emergency financial assistance. And that's short term, uh, used to be a capped at three months. They recently expanded that to six months uh, financial assistance. And that can be rental assistance or mortgage assistance um, that's, that's provided on behalf of individuals or families. Um, so in that case, it could be uh, people that are, it's a, a more of a homeless prevention activity. So to prevent foreclosure, to prevent eviction, uh, for individuals that can't make um, rent or mortgage payments as a result of coronavirus or even before coronavirus as a result of some financial hardship. Uh, there will also be HUD guidance coming soon on the topic of rental arrears. That's something that we hear a lot about. Um, we have an eviction moratorium right now, but but while that's while the, the moratorium is happening, 
people are accumulating um, past, you know, past months of, of uh, rental arrears. And that means like months where they didn't pay their rent. So uh, HUD's gonna provide some guidance on that soon. And uh, one other area that I just wanted to, 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 to mention was emergency homeless shelter activities. So um, things like uh, winter warming shelters were common even before COVID. And now since COVID, we've had additional uh, emergency homeless shelter activity needs, uh, whether that's you know quarantine shelters or uh, additional uh, expenditures related to, to quarantine people within shelters, things like that. And those are commonly funded through CDBG and ESG, but now through um, with, with the CARES Act money, if it's COVID related, there's also additional resources for that. Uh, so I, I think that kind of covers just some of them. Again, this is just some selected activities. There's other ones as well. There's uh, the Community Development Black Grant Program funds a very, very wide range of activities at the local and state level. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, it's how communities choose to spend this money is dictated by what their local needs are, as well as what their feedback is from the community. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, the planning process is, is that opportunity to sort of have our voices heard and, and, and let them know where, you know, you believe as providers, the needs are within the community. Uh, so um, I just wanted to cover these kind of things. And that was really the main thing I wanted to talk about was the planning process and how that, how that relates um, at the local level to the funding that HUD is providing and how it can be used uh, to assist um, homeless and at-risk homeless individuals. Uh, so now uh, Brett's going to come in and talk some about the kind of the national level stuff that, that she's working with at the HUD Stamps office. So Brett. Great. Thanks, Mark. Um, and thank you all for being here today. I know you're really, really busy doing really great work. Um, so I'm going to keep my presentation short and leave plenty of time for questions. Uh, I'm going to cover a few updates from the fiscal year 19 competition, as well as some uh, coronavirus updates. Uh, so next slide, Dan. Great. Um, so before we jump into the 2019 competition, let me address the elephant in the room. And I've already done this in the chat as well, but I have no, no information right now on the 2020 competition. I know you're wondering, I know you ask us every Friday, uh, but we don't have any information yet. As soon as we do, we'll put it out through the listserv and we'll probably talk about it on office hours. Um, so for the 2019 competition, uh, I want to talk about some highlights on what was new or newer um, and some where people went wrong if you're wondering why what was funded doesn't look like what you submitted. So really, really quickly, um, as a reminder, the majority of the funding process takes place locally. Um, it's COCs that are responsible for developing their process and rating and ranking projects. In general, unless it's coming through an appeal, uh, we at HUD only review those projects that are sent to us through the COC on the, one of the priority listings. And then we select projects based on where they fit in the funding tiers. Tier one in the 2019 competition, and this is the number that changes every year, was 100% of first time renewals plus 94% of the annual renewal amounts of all of your other eligible renewals. And in general, as long as a project meets HUD's quality threshold, if it's ranked in tier one, it's going to be selected by us. Um, the real competition is in tier two. Um, okay, one of the newer things in 2019, we had DV bonus money again. Um, and this year, a COC could submit any number of projects within their eligible amount for rapid rehousing and joint component projects. This is different than 2018 when it was one per component type. You could submit as many as you wanted, uh, but you could only submit one coordinated entry grant. And all of these projects had to be limited to serving people who qualify under category four of our homeless definition. We selected these projects using an 100 point scale. And if the project wasn't selected as a bonus project, it could have been selected as a regular new project depending on where the COC ranked it and how the COC scored if it was ranked in tier two. Your grant number would have determined if it was selected as a regular project or as a bonus project and different rules apply depending on how it was selected. We had the expansion process again this year, and I think it went a little more smoothly than last year. 
Um, but this allows COCs to expand eligible renewals by adding units, services, or for HMIS grants, additional HMIS activities. Um, in order to be considered, and this is kind of the important thing, we needed to have all of the information in the second bullet as part of your application. So we needed to know the grant number of the eligible, renew eligible renewal of the project you were expanding, and we had to know how you were planning to expand that project. We can't guess in applications. We have to take what's given to us by you all. And so if this wasn't filled out correctly, it's possible that your project uh, was denied as an expansion. If it still met threshold though, and still met quality standards, then we would have funded it as a standalone new project. If we had all that information though, and both the new and the renewal were selected, then you would have received one grant agreement from your field office that incorporates both applications. Uh, we had transition grants again this year. And just a reminder, we developed this process based on feedback from you all um, that you would reallocate a project, you wanted to create a new project, you wanted to use the same recipient, oftentimes you wanted to use the same building if you were say had a site based TH and you wanted to do site based PSH. But the time that it was taking for us to award the new project left you with a big gap between when the renewal expired and wasn't funded anymore and you couldn't oftentimes continue to pay staff or pay for the operating expenses of this of your buildings. So this was developed to help solve that problem. And it basically allows you to take the renewal project, eliminate it through reallocation and create a new project of a different component. So you can go from TH to PSH. The new project starts immediately after the renewal project expires. So there's absolutely no gap in funding. And then you can use up to 50% of the funds that were awarded in the 2019 competition for the project that's being eliminated. So you can use it to wind down your grant while you wind up your new grant or start your new grant, I guess. And then when it applies for renewal or whatever the funding process is in the year that you come in, um, you'll use the new component and you'll use the new BLIs in that application to HUD. Next slide. Great, and then finally consolidations. As uh, you all know, and much to the consternation of many of you, we, you can no longer consolidate projects outside of the competition. Um, so your opportunity uh, to consolidate two or more projects is during the competition. And I know it's tricky and requires a lot of applications to be submitted because we need the new consolidated application and we need the, um, all of the renewal applications to be in the system so that we have everything that we need in case something goes wrong with that single consolidated application. And when you're applying for a single consolidated application, we need everything that's in the second bullet. We need budget line items that match all of the numbers you provide. We need the expiring grant numbers. We need your operating start and end dates. All of the projects need to be in good standing with us. And you need to be consolidating projects with the same component and the same recipient. If we didn't have any of this information, we may not have approved the consolidation. Um, but if the consolidation wasn't approved and we had all the information and those projects, those renewal projects met threshold, um, then we would just go ahead and award the original renewals without consolidating them. And you can try again uh, in the next funding cycle. Although um, I think we have to wait and see how 2020 turns out. We get a lot of questions on office hours about will we be able to consolidate in 2020, even if we don't have a competition. And um, I just, I don't, we don't know anything about 2020 yet, so I can't tell you. I see a note to, uh, in the chat to provide the acronyms. So BLI is budget line item, um, GIW is grant inventory worksheet. And then I think I said TH, which is transitional housing and PSH, which is permanent supportive housing. Uh, next slide, and we're going to switch gears to coronavirus, which is, I think, all that's been on any of our minds for what 
seems like forever and no time at all, all at the same time. Um, so let's start with ESG funding. Mark mentioned some of this earlier. Uh, we had $4 billion made available through ESG to help communities prevent, prepare for, and respond to coronavirus. Um, 4 million was set aside for technical assistance um, and the remainder was awarded to entitlement communities. Uh, we did a billion in a first round of funding and it was based off of the normal ESG funding. And then the second tranche was the remaining 2.96 billion and was based off of a formula that was targeted, that really targeted communities with high rates of homelessness, both sheltered and unsheltered. Uh, Michigan, I believe had 119 allocations, which uh, you all are well on your way to getting under grant agreement and spending. Um, in September, we went ahead and published a notice that provided additional flexibilities and eligible costs, along with a few restrictions. And I'll talk about all those in a minute. And we also issued new certifications with that notice. And uh, if you don't feel like reading the whole notice, if you're not an ESG recipient and you don't need to know all the nitty gritty uh, regulations and requirements around those funds, take a look at that TA resource. Um, it provides a great summary of the ESG CV notice and what communities can use their ESG CV dollars as well as their annual ESG dollars on when they're working to prevent, prepare for, and respond to coronavirus. Uh, a few things to note, uh, can stay here, Dan, but just a few things to note before we talk about the eligible activities, which are now on the slide. Um, the CARES Act waived all match requirements for ESG CV dollars. It waived the shelter cap for ESG CV dollars. And it also requires that nobody experiencing homelessness can be expected to participate in services or meet any other preconditions to receive assistance that's funded under the ESG CV program. So these funds are really meant to be used in a low barrier way to prevent the spread of COVID-19. And then on the slide, you're gonna see eligible costs. ESG CV dollars can be used on any of the normal ESG activities that are in the ESG rule. And then there are some new eligible costs that uh, were added as part of the notice. For example, landlord incentives. Um, you can also pay volunteer incentives, which is new for us. So we know communities have had a really hard time keeping or getting volunteers that are needed because as we're going into stay at home orders and people are getting sick. So you can use these dollars to reward your volunteers uh, for coming out and continuing to potentially put themselves in harm's way in a reasonable manner. Uh, what is super important to know is that communities can go back and reimburse for any of these eligible activities to the date that they began preventing, preparing for, and responding to coronavirus. The earliest date we know is January 21st, but the community needs to be documenting when they started preventing for or preparing for coronavirus. And then from that date forward, the ESG recipient can go back and reimburse some of those costs. Um, as I mentioned, these funds are going to ESG recipients, so states, uh, urban counties, metropolitan cities, and territories. Uh, if anything on this list looks like something that might be helpful to you in your efforts, as Mark said, you've really got to coordinate with your ESG recipient and be involved in that planning process. Part of what the CARES Act did was it eliminated the um, coordination requirements that normally come with ESG dollars, but many communities are coordinating. They are required to post how they're spending the money online. Um, so you should be able to see how your local governments or your state is using the money and um, how they're granting out the money locally. We've also been encouraging state and local governments to look for new subrecipients, and we've provided resources on the HUD exchange on how to expand the subrecipient base because this is a lot of money. Um, and also the more providers we can engage, the more likely we are to have a program that serves um, 
communities that have traditionally been underserved and are overrepresented in our communities, including Black and Indigenous people and other people of color. So really reach out and find new subrecipients if you can, and we have tools to help you. Next slide. Um, I always feel like I have the like boring, dry stuff, but more boring and dry. Uh, we've been busy at headquarters publishing waivers for annual ESG, COC, and YHDP. This is really meant to help you be able to use the funds that you have on the ground already to more efficiently respond to coronavirus. Uh, we've published three mega waivers at this point, beginning in March. We published a second one in May, and then the final one we published at the end of September. Um, and of course, there's always the ESG CV notice, which includes waivers for ESG CV and annual ESG funds that are used to prevent, prepare for, and respond to coronavirus. I'm not going to go through all those waivers today. Take a look at them, read them in their completeness. If you have any questions, ask on office hours or submit an AAQ. We've also gone through a lot of detail on these on office hours. So you can go back and look at the office hours around the date that they were published. We generally do an office hours either right before they're published or right after they're published. Um, but in the general, we've waived things like FMR caps, disability documentation requirements, one year lease requirements, monthly case management requirements, the requirements to do physical um, HQS inspections, pretty much anything we're hearing from you is challenging to do during times of social distancing or when your staff are out because they aren't feeling well or they have to be home with their kids. Um, we have tried to provide waivers around. We also know that your spending patterns are a little bit different right now, um, not typical. So we published an expedited amendment process for fiscal year 18 and 19 grants that will help you be able to move your, your budgets around between line items a little more quickly. Um, it also for fiscal year 18 grants, if you're still operating your 18 grant and you have some money left over, it lets you extend your grant term. You do have to ask before your grant actually expires. We can't extend after your grant has expired, but it lets us extend your grant term a little bit longer to help you use that money to keep people housed and to provide services, uh, but not past December 31st, so we can't affect your renewal. Uh, more information on all of this is on the HUD exchange. And I'll also note that one of the waivers that's in um, the March mega waiver, I believe, as well as the September mega waiver, is that any of those grant agreement amendments that we're doing kind of between March and December, we'll consider them temporary. So we had a lot of questions about, well, what if I move money, but this is sort of an atypical spending period. This isn't how I want to apply for renewal when I come in for renewal in the competition. That's fine. We'll consider them temporary and you will apply in the next competition, however your budget was before March when communities really got into spending the bulk of their money in atypical ways. Next slide, please. Um, we are also publishing a ton of resources to help communities implement their ESG CV resources effectively. Um, they are all on the website that's on the screen. We also host office hours every Friday at 2.30 Eastern time. And we usually do, for those of you who have attended a short presentation with CDC, with communities, with other federal partners. And then we use the bulk of our time to answer any questions on any topic um, that anyone in the audience has. Um, I would encourage you, even if you're not an ESG CV uh, recipient, to take a look at these resources. They're not all ESG CV specific, but can really provide tips to help you uh, create a more effective homeless assistance system in your community. Uh, and I will just flag, there's a lot there. So on office hours this week, the plan is to um, spend most of the time sort of reviewing what we see as the top resources for you to really pay attention to right now. Uh, I think next, Mark, you're gonna walk us through just a few more resources, is that right? And then we'll hop over to Teams for the Q&A. 
Yeah, sure. Thanks, Brett. So, uh, yeah, these are mostly like I mentioned in the beginning. I just we just wanted to provide a lot of like linked information. Uh, I always like to, to to put this out there in case people are wondering. Um, some people like to review federal regulations or you know just read more about stuff on their own. Um, all these sort of blue underlined things are links. So if we can send this out maybe as a PDF or something like that, hopefully the link should be embedded still and you'll be able to just click on it and go to it. Um, so Dan, you can go to the next one. Uh, the one thing that I will say is, is HUD exchange, right? So www.hudexchange.info. That's a good overall resource and starting point for all the sort of HUD news that comes out of our office tends to be funneled through that HUD exchange. Um, so there's also a HUD coronavirus page, but again, a lot of the stuff that relevant to, to, to community planning development. So it's in COC grants or ESG grants, it's gonna end up on the HUD exchange as well. Um, one other thing is, is I just wanted to mention is, you know, our office is a resource, right? So in Detroit, so if you um, have questions on stuff, if you're not sure on something, that's what our office is here for is to answer those questions. So don't be afraid to reach out to your representatives, uh, the financial analysts, myself or Ellen or Keith, if you have, if you have questions, I, like for instance, if you, if you want to get involved in the local planning process, but you're not sure who your point of contact is, um, you reach out to your representative, we can find that information out for you and pass it along. So, uh, you know, don't be shy to reach out to us and ask us questions or, or, um, you know, um, for assistance, that's what we're here for. Uh, so the next slide, I think Dan just has more links. Um, a ton of CARES Act links and in, in, in resources. So if you wanted to, if you were interested in in what's in the actual language of the CARES Act, um, how they, the amounts that were given out to everybody, uh, Brett was mentioning some of the waivers and things like that. All that kind of information is is provided through these links. Um, so tons of them, obviously. So. And I think that's pretty much all we had. There's Brett and I's contact info. Um, so again, I don't know if what Brett, wants to, Brett wants to come back in, but for those that are coming over to the other session, we'll, we're, we're gonna be available to answer questions that, that anybody has. But again, I think Brett mentioned, and I just wanna say too, thanks so much for, for all of your work um, out there on the front lines, uh, helping the, the people most in need and the homeless community. And so, uh, you know, I, I've, been, I've been truly in awe of all the, the work that's been done even before COVID, but especially in the face of, of, an, of a, a global pandemic and the way that um, the provider organizations and, and communities and stuff have pulled together and, and really um, worked so hard on this and, and ensured that um, the people that are most in need uh, are getting the assistance that they, that they need right now. So again, just from, from me personally and, and on behalf of HUD, thank you so much for all the efforts that y'all do every day. All right. <clears throat> All right. This is uh, uh, Dan again. I want to thank uh, Brett and Mark for taking the time to do this. Uh, there were a couple questions that came in that were answered in the in the chat box, but uh, anything that's still not answered is going to be tabled until we move over to the other session. A um, couple of uh, administrative notes. This session was recorded and um, will be made available, you know, the same way as the other uh, uh, summit materials are made available. We'll also provide the slide deck to um, the summit organizers so they can make that available to everyone as well. Um, and like uh, Mark had pointed out, the blue lettering in the slide deck are actually hyper, those are hyperlinked text. So you're able to just click on that, that one, I go in the slideshow and click on that link and go to where it, you need to go. Um, so unless uh, Brett or Mark have anything else, we're gonna uh, close this down and move over to the team session starting at two. Thank you all very much.